Hello, everybody. Welcome to unit number four, energy and photosynthesis for honors biology. This is chapter six in your textbook if you would like to have a reference for you to use. Let's begin. This chapter starts with energy. Um, the reason we need to discuss energy is because life requires energy. So the production, the consumption of energy is very, very important. Almost all life on earth almost all not quite almost all life on earth requires the sun in some way shape or form the reason i say almost all there are organisms that live on the bottom of the ocean and they can produce food without sunlight so therefore there are the, there's an exception to that rule there are some organisms at the bottom of the ocean in the dark and they do this process called chemosynthesis it's a little different than photosynthesis so photosynthesis uses photo light chemo the bottom of the ocean uses chemicals for the synthesis or production of their food. Organisms that do this, organisms that can produce their own food, either using photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, are called autotrophs, right there. The autotrophs are plants, algae, which are seaweeds, for example, I'm showing you algae, plants over here. Some bacteria also are autotrophs, okay? So we have green bacteria. They do not have chloroplasts, but they can do photosynthesis. Heterotrophs, well, here's one of my daughters right here, and here's another one of my daughters. I have to include both of them in the picture. These are examples of heterotrophs, organisms that must eat in order to get their energy. So they take their energy from their food. These organisms down here, these are protista. This is a cartoon drawing, but this is generally what they look like. A lot of them, they're unicellular. They, are, they look like a combination sometimes of plants and animals. They're kind of unique. Generally speaking, I've said this to my students before in class, if we were in class, I'd be telling you that when a new species of something is discovered and we don't know where to classify it, it almost always ends up in the protus grouping, all right? Fungus up here, fungi, they need to consume or take energy from their environment. They do not produce their own food. So we have animals, we have fungi, we have protus, or animals over here. These are just some cute ones. The energy currency of a cell. So the molecule of a cell that actually supplies the actual energy that is being used, this, it's called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And this is what it looks like chemically down here. It's a little more com complicated. So I gave you a little simpler picture right there. What is it made out of? A sugar called ribose, okay, um, a nitrogen-containing compound called adenine, and three phosphates. This is a tri, one, two, three, triphosphates. You have a bond that holds these phosphates together, it even holds them over here, the ribose and the adenine. Well, the bond that's holding them together is called covalent bond. This is a very tight bond. So when this bond is broken, it would yield a lot of energy, and that's pretty much how the energy is removed. So you start with ATP. This is the highest energy. A hydrolysis reaction, a breaking down reaction takes place, and it breaks one of the covalent bonds, releasing a phosphate. When that happens, energy is released. The cell is be able to do um, its actions based off of that, um, the energy that came from the covalent bond as it was broken. When you break off one of these phosphates, now you're left with a molecule that has a little less energy. So you start with ATP, and then you take off one of the phosphates, and now you have two phosphates. You have ADP, adenosine di, and the di stands for two diphosphates. It's a lower energy molecule than ATP. AMP, adenosine monophosphate, has mono, one phosphate attached to it. And this has the least energy of the three. So in order of energy, ATP has the most, ADP has the second most, and AMP has the third most. So in order to make ATP, phosphates are attached to ADPs. You take one with two, you attach a phosphate, and now you make ATP. So when ATP is used up, it becomes ADP. When, then ADP can add a phosphate and be returned back to its shape or form as ATP. Now, it is very important for you to have an understanding of what are called oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions. When you take chemistry next year, most of you will notice um, you're going to go into redox or oxidation reduction reactions in a great deal of detail. A lot of detail is going to go into this. We are going to simplify it. I'm going to make it extremely simple. This is not how you will be taught reduction and oxidation when you take chemistry. Um, there's more to it than what I'm going to be explaining to you. So let's keep it simple for the sake of uh, what we need to know for biology. Right? So these reactions are important because pretty much when energy is transferred in living things, it requires the transfers of electrons.
So these reactions, oxidation reduction reactions, are very important in living things because this is how energy is transferred along. Okay, so it requires electrons being either taken, gained, or lost by two different things, and when that takes place, energy can be transferred from something basically to another thing. Oxidation. First off, let's begin with talking about oxidation. What does that mean? Something loses one or more electrons. All right. So you do not understand the chemistry of this, but I'm going to explain to you something and keep it really simple. If something loses an electron, so if you minus, and electrons are a negative one charge, if something minuses because it lost a minus one charge, it will become positive. You are going to learn it like this when you learn it in chemistry. So something loses an electron, it minuses a minus one, it becomes more positive in charge. You may look down here at this chemical equation, you don't see any positives or negatives. So you will have no way based on what you know currently on how to look for that. All right, so I'm going to explain to you how to find it. A reduction. This is a reaction in which something actually gains electrons. So it adds a negative to it, so it becomes charged more negatively. So re things that are reduced become generally more negative. Things that are oxidized become more positive. So oxidation is the noun. Oxidized is the verb found here. Reduction is the noun. Reduced is the verb. Now, they generally come together. When something is reduced, the other thing needs to be oxidized. They happen together. These reactions are paired together. Now, here's how we're going to simplify it for you. We are going to tell, I'm telling you right now, that the electrons that we are going to be dealing with are associated with hydrogen atoms. So you have hydrogen atoms in two different locations in this chemical equation. So let's go over this equation real quick. This equation says carbon dioxide and water, six carbon dioxides and six waters. We're not worried about the numbers right now. Carbon dioxide and water together, you add those things together, and they produce, during photosynthesis, sugar. This is glucose, C6H12O6, sugar or glucose, and oxygen. So left of the arrow means it reacts, right of the arrow is what's produced. So in photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water react, and sugar, glucose, and oxygen are produced. Now what you need to know is that all of the electrons we are talking about are associated with hydrogen atoms. So you're going to find, for example, a reactant that pairs with a product, in this case CO2 pairs with C6H12O6. Well, what happens to CO2? CO2 here, there's no hydrogens in carbon dioxide. There's no hydrogens associated with it. But in this reaction, CO2 gets converted into sugar, and hydrogens are added to it. Yes, more carbons and more oxygens are also added, but we are not worrying about carbons and oxygens in regards to reduction and oxidation. We are referencing the hydrogen atoms specifically. So CO2 has no hydrogens, and now all of a sudden it goes over here and it becomes C6H12O6. So it now has added hydrogen atoms. So it has added electrons, it has gained electrons. CO2 gains electrons and becomes glucose. So since it gained electrons, CO2 is reduced and it is turned into glucose. Water over here pairs with oxygen over here. And water, you'll notice, starts with hydrogens and it comes and becomes oxygen. And there's no longer hydrogens attached to it. So water has now lost hydrogens or lost electrons and it becomes oxygen. So water is oxidized and turned into oxygen. All right, so let's review that. Carbon dioxide gains hydrogens or gains electrons and becomes reduced and turned into glucose. Water loses hydrogens and becomes oxidized and turned into oxygen gas. Now here are the two equations showing you photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Our next unit will cover cellular respiration in depth, but I want you to have an idea and a familiarity of how they are related. You'll probably notice that the things on the right over here are on the left, and then the reactants over here are products. So reactants in photosynthesis are products in respiration. Products of photosynthesis are reactants of cellular respiration. So you may notice they're kind of reverses, flip-flops of each other. ATP is present over here because that is the main product of respiration. The whole idea of respiration, you and I and every living thing does it, they do it to make their energy, their ATP. But in order to make their ATP, living things like heterotrophs, like you and me, we need food. 
And we depend on that food from photosynthesis. We depend on the oxygen from photosynthesis. So the products of photosynthesis allow us to produce energy. They allow us to get food, glucose, and oxygen. Those are products, excuse me, these are the products of photosynthesis, reactants of respiration, all right? So let's go back and review. Photosynthesis, six carbon dioxides and six waters, and this is a balanced equation. I'm not gonna ask you a lot about these numbers and what they mean. You will be doing a lot of that in chemistry next year, but just let's keep it simple. Carbon dioxide and water react, to produce glucose and oxygen. This is photosynthesis. Say our respiration, glucose and oxygen react to produce carbon dioxide and water. So they're flip-flops of each other. And energy is the main product of respiration. It is not always included in the equation. I'm including it here in red to show you what is primarily produced in respiration. What is primarily produced in photosynthesis is food. Oxygen is not the primary primary product of photosynthesis. It is a waste product that you and I enjoy. We need it. We need it to live. Photosynthesis. All right. So let's go over photosynthesis real general right now. We're going to get into the details in our next video. Photosynthesis happens in two parts. There's two parts of photosynthesis. And I just went over this equation on the previous slide. In order for photosynthesis to happen, light is needed. Carbon dioxide is needed. That enters through the leaves enters through these tiny holes in the leaves called stomata. So they allow carbon dioxide to enter so that photosynthesis can happen. Water is also needed. How does water get into the plant? It enters the roots and makes its way up the plant using adhesion and cohesion and the evaporation of water. It pulls it up the plant, okay? So water needs to get up here in these leaves. It comes up the plant because water can stick to itself. It can stick to other things. And as it evaporates, it actually pulls it up. Oxygen is a waste product. Oxygen leaves the leaves. Carbon dioxide enters the leaf. Oxygen leaves the leaf. Okay. Glucose is also the main product. Organic molecules, sugar in this case. The main product, sugar is formed in the leaves also. Okay. What controls all this? Everything. Photosynthesis is all controlled by special proteins called enzymes. The two parts, and we're going to go over them in detail in the, in the next video, are called the light reactions and Calvin cycle. And where does this happen in a plant or an algae like a uh, seaweed? It happens inside of the chloroplast. Bacteria or prokaryotes do not have chloroplasts. They do this process inside of their plasma membrane. And chloroplast structure to end this lecture. Um, we learned a little bit about this in our last unit. We have a couple membranes on the outside. They're found in plants and algae, not just plants. The thylakoids are these, in, in, those are these little chips. They look like poker chips, one poker chip, so to speak. It's called a thylakoid. A stack of them is called a granum. Um, many of them are called grana. That would be many stacks of, of thylakoids. Stroma is the liquid area inside of there. What do you find in plastids or chromoplasts? You find pigments, compounds that absorb light. They, they look colorful. What is unique about compounds? Well, when you see a plant and you see green, your eyes are seeing the color of light that is reflected towards your eyes. So plants, they do not absorb green light. You can see down here, this is called the absorption spectrum. Green is down here, and this shows you the pigments. They're not absorbing a lot of light in the green range. Plants do not like green light. If you put a plant in a green light or under a green light, that plant will die because it will not be able to absorb any of the energy. And the energy, um, the energy comes from the photons of light. So let's get back to this. Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, there's an A and a B. All right. This shows you the absorption of A. This line here is chlorophyll A. All right. Chlorophyll B is this other green line. It's right over here. These are the two main pigments involved in absorbing light for photosynthesis. There's also other pigments called carotenoids. Um, they are other colors. For example, these are found in the chromoplasts, yellows and oranges and browns. They're called accessory pigments. They also absorb light of different wavelengths or of different color. And they are just, they aid in photosynthesis, all right? They are not the, carotenoids are not the main pigments that absorb light. The main pigments are chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and B specifically. So chlorophyll B, what's different? Well, chlorophyll B absorbs a little bit more blue light than chlorophyll A, all right? And it absorbs less red light than chlorophyll, in this case, chlorophyll A. 
the primary colors plants like, you need to know this, are, are reds and blues. Reds and blues are the primary colors. I know this color here seems like it's in the purple range, but in reality, these are they really like blues. And these colors here are shifted more towards the reds. They really prefer reds and they prefer blues. Plants like red and blue light the most. Actually, they prefer white light. White light includes all colors of light. So if you really want your plant to work its best, you put it in white light, specifically all colors of light, all right? Green light would kill your plant. If you just, if all your plant had was green light, a light bulb with green, you would kill it over time. It would not be absorbing any light, all right? Blue and red light, plants will do okay in blue and red light, yes. Ideally white light, which is the light in your, from the sun, it includes all colors. We're gonna stop there.